Hi everyone, it's Kelly from The Hub, here today with my dad, Roger. Remember, he's the wood turner and has done lots of, of uh, episodes with us to teach us a little bit about his lathe and to show us all the fun little things and the beauty that you can get through wood. So today's episode is we are, he has some, he calls them the odd things um, that he's turned out of wood. I, I have to tell you, I'm not quite sure what's on this list. So this could be truly an educational experience for both of us. And he has a, 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 a surprise after we do that. So first, let's look at the odd things. Yeah, you would think that after three episodes of the gallery, we would have covered everything. But, this is why I'm like, I don't know what in hell did you make? Because <laughs> I don't know if I remember anything else. But maybe well, as soon so, as I see it, I'll go, right. So you'll see. So I, um, I don't own all of these things anymore. So some of them I've sold and given away, whatever. So I took, had to take photographs. So um, we'll go back. We'll start the slideshow again. And, uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, cool. Come on, baby. Perfect, it's coming up. Okay. Glorious. So, the first thing we, uh, that we have, uh, we're gonna look at these little oddball things and they are uh, much to your disbelief, I'm sure, if you watch the three episodes of the gallery, these are things that don't really fit into any category. Uh, so this will expand even further the the concept about, you know, how, what are, what are all the different things you can make on the lathe. So, all I got to do is figure out, oops, I forgot it goes that way. All right. Um, you may remember the plate early on that I think we call, I call the planetary plate. Um, and I, had a brainstorm somewhere along the way after I made a few of those that, wait a minute, I could make little tiny ones of those and go to the craft store and buy a clip and put a clip on the back and make little pins to put on your sweater, your jacket, or whatever. And I have so, one of those. I forgot about it. I, and I thought, when I wear it, people always are like, where did you get that? And I always say, well, well my father made that. Now you can tell them and you can give them my phone number so that they're my, my, my email. So I'll send them, I'll send for a certain price, I'll send them some. <laughs> so these work out really well for using scraps of exotic wood. So the backgrounds on all of these are all exotics. I think the top left is zebra wood, but I'm not positive. The one on the right is rosewood. Then the bottom one on the left is Purple Heart, and the bottom one on the right is Kokoboro. So those are all tropical exotics, but the pieces, the little dowels in the middle, are off-center, off are local things that, um, if you know wood, you'll recognize there's ash in there, and, and apple, and... and uh, a laminate, the one on the bottom right has a, lam a little piece of laminate in it along with some uh, veneer and a little thin stripe going through there. And then after I made a couple, I said, uh, I'd be able to gussy those up a little bit and make them look more like jewelry. So I went to the craft store and I bought some little crystals. Uh, those are, I think they call them Swarovski crystals or something, they're actually crystal. And so the one on the, top right is clear and the one on the top left has two little sort of amber colored crystals in them. I made these because like somebody somewhere along the way we talked about how if you do kind of a craft show it's a good thing to have little stuff that sells because somebody might not you know a lot of people don't want to pay $150 for a nice vase but they'll pay 20 bucks for something like this so whatever so that's what I tried. I tried with these they were not a big hit. So you may have the only one that's actually being worn in the entire United States. <laughs> but 
but I like them. I think they're cute. I think and they're, they're cool. And they're, uh, they're delicate. Their biggest one's about two inches. The smallest one's uh, probably an inch and a half or so. But they're, you know, on a sweater or a lapel, a coat lapel or something like that. Okay. This, you may be able to tell from the little slot up there at the top is a bank. And I have, uh, this is one that I made, but I have an antique beehive bank. Um, so on my laptop, that's about, looks like it's about four, I mean, my iPad looks like it's about four or five inches tall. It may be four. I have an antique one made out of maple. This one is cherry. Um, and the antique one's probably about three inches tall. And if you remember the last episode, I showed you the bead making tool that you use to make. Uh, and I made a finial with four different size beads. So I used four different size bead making tools. But this one, this is a perfect example of how, of why bead making tools were invented. Because I used the same bead making tool and every single bead's the same diameter, the same width all the way up. Uh, the arrow points to the place where it actually comes apart. So the, the fun part in these and the challenge is to make it so that you've got a, uh, so it actually breaks in half uh, right on one of the slots so that the seam between the top and the bottom is hidden. So I made this and gave it to uh, uh, sort of an adoptive grandchild of mine. Um, and this lot, you just cut the slot with a Dremel with a saw blade on it and then clean it up a little bit so that a quarter will fit in there. So practical things that uh, ancestors made on the lathe, uh, like this, you know, little toys and, and little gadgets of one kind or another, little containers to keep stuff in and whatever, and here's a bank. That's very cool. Yeah, I like it. It's fun. This one on the left, the pictures on the left show a wooden top. There are um, the, the people that I've seen online that make these have mostly been Asian. I think these are a, sort of an Asian phenomenon. You take a nice piece of hardwood, a couple inches in diameter, and that's all in one piece. So the top, you have to cut it down all the way from a couple inches in diameter all the way down to less than a quarter of an inch. And you leave a little ball on the end of it to spin. And then um, all you have to do really is shape the bottom down to a graceful point. And you can see my little adoptive grandson over on the side there, that's Graham. And Graham is playing with his top and making a face at the same time. But you see he's got a hold of the little knob on there and all you have to, you have to get it takes practice to grab the little knob on the top and be able to spin it with two fingers, two or three fingers, and get it to spin. It'll spin a long time, um, on a, but it's got to be very flat, of course, because if it's not, then it'll run right off to the low side of the table. But uh, any grandpas out there who, uh, who want to make toys for their, their grandkids, they have to be, uh, I would say, probably at least four or five years old in order to be able to do it. The thing is sort of like snapping your fingers like this, just the thing between your thumb and your finger and then spin it. Uh, it's an acquired skill. I think his father told me it took him um, an hour, half an hour or so to get him so he could really do it on his own so he wasn't totally frustrated with doing it. So a uh, top. And these are pretty easy to make. Uh, they don't require much uh, sophistication and design or whatever. Uh, and if you wanted to laminate some wood together so that they'd make flashy things when they spin, then you could do that with walnut and maple and whatever and, and make them stripey and um, all that stuff. So, but there you go, a top. Okay. Answer the phone. <laughs> so these pieces, the caption is for real. These are one of the weirder experiences that I ever had with the lathe. I was back when I, before I retired, Sunday night was always hard for me. I would, I'd plan, you know, done planning over the weekend and, 
you know, things for my classes were, you know, I'd figured out what I was going to do here and there or whatever. But I always had kind of a hard time going to sleep on Sunday night. So I was lying in bed and I couldn't sleep, couldn't sleep. And I don't know if I actually fell asleep or not, but all of a sudden I got up out of bed, went into the den, took a piece of paper out of the copier and drew the design for this, these pieces. And I have no idea in the world where it came from and I've never seen anybody, any, anybody else make anything that looked quite like these. A friend of mine saw these in my house and she asked if they were for sale. And I said, yeah, I guess so. So she bought them and she keeps um, little tea lights in there, like candle, little electronic candles and come up on her mantle. So it's really a goblet form with a, with a foot and a long stem and a top that's, uh, you know, a, a truncated triangle. But the tops are made out of, the bases and the tops are made out of the same logs. That's a silver maple that's uh, from a hollow tree. And the stems and the rings on the, they're made from walnut. So they're weird. And I don't know how else to describe them. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but you can see the woods like some of the other things that I made. They're quite thin. Um, the woods are, the wood is full of uh, wormholes and ant trails and hollow. Uh, hollow from a hollow tree, the reason it dips, dishes out like this on all, all of them dish out uh, around the hollow in the tree. So, you know, we talked before about designing and and sometimes designing is work and sometimes you just kind of sit down and see what inspires you and this design is like okay it came to me in my sleep never you know that's weird but anyhow they're very unusual and i i've never made another one actually i made one with a more of a globe shaped top and didn't like the proportion so it still sits down on my bench but i've never made any other ones like this i'm thinking that one of these days i'll make a miniature one see if I can get, you know, get all that detail into one about two or three inches tall. That'd be fun, a fun little challenge. Okay, there you go. See if you can answer that question. What is this? <laughs> I, I, I started out once to try to make Christmas tree ornaments out of wood. People, I've seen people do that, and some of them are beautiful, graceful. They sometimes are very complicated. They use complicated tools and <clears throat> make them hollow, but swirled at the same time and all kinds of weird things. I saw something like this, I think, one time, but the idea is, and there's one thing about it I don't like, and I'll tell you that at the outset. The thing in the middle is, is an egg in my imagination, in my design imagination, there's an egg there and the egg is walnut. And then the top and the bottom that hold the egg are spalted maple from a hollow tree that I think is the same maple as in those goblets I just showed you. Hmm. Problem, and then the top and the bottom, the foot and the top, the roof, are apple and they're nice and dark and they have nice detail in them. What didn't turn out right here is that the maple is too dark. I wanted there to be contrast in the color between the, the eggshell and the egg. Um, but the maple pieces that make up the eggshell part turned out to be kind of dark. And by that time it was too late and I didn't feel like make, making it all over again. Again, this is what you would call a doodad, a what you call a a thingamabob. Oh, what's it? I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. It's an egg breaking out of a shell, but it's got a roof and a foot. So it's, I it's mean, it's weird, but it's it is really weird. cool. And you know what? I was actually thinking of without the top, it's like an egg cup. Yes. Like you would, you know, you put soft boiled eggs or whatever level of boiled right. egg you like, and then you can. Right. Eat, them out, eat, eat it out of the shell as you tap the top. Right. That's what I was yeah, thinking. If, if, the, if the test for whether it's art or not is in its usefulness, then this is definitely art because it ain't useful. And that's for sure. And the thing about it is that, that I would say, you know, looking back on this, this is an illustration of how sometimes if you're a designer, 
of whatever, I think, architect, buildings, you know, a potter, uh, whatever, if you're designing anything in three dimensions, sometimes you're just intrigued by a shape. And so you want to make that shape. And whether it's useful or whether it makes sense or whatever is totally irrelevant. You're just intrigued by the shape. So that's, you know, the, that's kind of what's going on here. But all right. How much would I charge for this if I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This, this is a video I w when we were trying before we had trouble getting, getting the video to work. So I'll, I'll give it a try and see if I can get it to work. No, it's not working. I don't know why. Uh, this is one of the most complicated pieces of wood that I ever turned. I found a little piece of burl. It's quite small. It's a piece of oak. It's probably four, maybe five inches tall. And it is so complicated. And boy, I wish I could get that. I don't know how to. No, it doesn't want to work. So I did, and to back that up, I did take three photographs of it. So I don't know how much you can see on the, whatever device you're watching on, but this has rays that burst like starbursts. You can see one on the left side. Um, it, it has cracks. It has bark. It has holes. It has wormholes. It has eyes. It has swirls. It has all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the wood. It's just every square inch of this wood is complicated. And you can see on the top right a little bit this piece is not hollow very much. It sort of looks like a mortar. It's hollow down about an inch is all. And the reason I did that is because when, with, with burl like this, there's hardly such a thing as end grain and side grain like there is with a regular log. But when I started to cut out the top, there's pretty stuff down in there as well. So if I had made, if I'd made it hollow like a, like a koozie, uh, all that pretty stuff would have been way down the bottom. You couldn't see it. So I just hollowed it out like this uh, a little bit so that when you look down on uh, the top, you can see all that pretty stuff again. So it's just, I included this because it's again, it's another useless object that uh, is just, in this case, it wasn't that I was intrigued by the shape. It was intrigued by, I was intrigued by the detail in the wood. So there you go. And lastly, one day I was rummaging around in my scrap box. Sorry about that. Rummaging around in my scrap box and I was struck again as I have been a number of times with just how amazingly different all the pieces of wood are that from different species and depending on how they're cut and how old they are, whatever. <clears throat> So I said, wait a minute, you know, and I made this. I made a walnut frame and I got a piece of masonite on the back and I painted black and I cut these pieces so they sort of fit together in a sort of a Mondrian uh, style. Some of them I left natural with raggedy edges. You see there's two or three rounds there uh, and a circle, even a circle inlay there sort of center left. Um, and just all the amazing things going on with all these different kinds of wood. So there's lacy maple, that round is mulberry, there's uh, Russian olive at the top right hand corner with eyes in it. Uh, it's a piece of pine, a piece of wormy chestnut, some white cedar, a piece of laminate that I made, some oak, some coca bolo, three spalted pieces that all three of those to me look like maps. The one on the bottom left-hand corner to me looks like a map of Spain, sort of the coast of Spain, <laughs> and cherry and all kinds of weird stuff with stripes and lace and spalts and eyes and wormholes and all kinds of stuff. So this hangs on the wall in my den and I signed, I put on the back for the love of wood. So there you go, another mini gallery of all the different things that you can make on, on the lathe that make no sense whatsoever. So there you go.
those are really neat and you're right i think that there's you know and then you could have you could have made nine thousand other kinds of things too yeah. I think, you know yeah. it's as varied as the person who is the lathe worker so yeah right right, right. those are very cool okay now very cool if you were watching, if you remember back, I think it's the first, the first episode, or maybe the second. I reached over to the side here and pulled out a pulled up a log and held it up, and I said, "This log is so ugly that I don't know if anybody could make anything out of it." But to me, this is a this is what I like. So here you go. This is what happened with that log. So I took the log. Are you there? And while that's while that's loading, I will just say that Dad and I have talked about this, and he wanted to. We we went around and around of how we were going to do this and what it was going to be and all this stuff. And he's like, "Well, should I show them? Or should I go down to the wood shop?" And I said, "Why don't you see? <coughs> Why don't you just make something?" And then you can, you know, you can show us what it is. So he actually made two things. Yep. I've seen the first one, but he, I'm, I'm very, I have not seen the second one. And so he wanted to surprise <clears throat> me about the second one. So I'm okay. really excited to see like how, I mean, truly, and this is like a walk in the woods, you pick it up piece of ugly wood and that's why we, that he wanted to do this and, let, and that that's why I was so excited about it. Yeah, actually, it was in my backyard. The tree had been had been damaged by squirrels, uh, and there's the log. Uh, that's two sides of the same piece of wood. I just rolled it over. Right, ninety so, percent of uh, of the universe would throw that into the burn pile. Yeah, the one on the the side of the left is where the squirrels ate all the bark off during the winter. They must have been really hungry. They ate all the bark off, and then they ate into the wood a little bit, and then it scabbed over. And I, uh, the one on the right is where uh, apparently a branch or uh, something uh, was damaged the log so so it, that it formed a, like a knot hole around that. So this is what we started out with. So what I did, oh, and if you look at the end grain of an oak log, and by the way, when I started turning this log, it was not dry enough. So normally I would not have turned this but I turned it anyhow to show you. And part of the reason, or part of, you can see in the, in the middle there where there's a crack around the center of the tree, I would guess that that tree was damaged when it was about 10 years old. And it had a, formed a scab there. And then the rest of the light colored wood grew on around it, but it never really bonded back to that place where there was damage. And oak logs are, all, are often very dark. There's a lot of what's called tannin in the in the wood, um, and it turns uh, dark when it oxidizes, and it especially turns dark if there's a nail or any kind of iron in the tree. You know, people pound nails in, put screw eyes in for clotheslines and whatever all the time. And uh, upstream from from a nail in an oak tree where the sap moves through, it stains the wood totally black. So there was, there's a stain in there somewhere. So here's the two pieces that I cut the log into. The one on the left is just a piece of the log and I just cut off the end. The one on the right, I cut it off, but then I turned it 90 degrees and sawed it out round on the bandsaw. So we're gonna, I'm gonna work on the one on the right first and uh, the number one piece. So here, and again, now that's a video, but I can't get it to spin. So you'll see in a minute, this piece is mounted on the lathe. And that looks like two different pieces of wood, but it's not, it's the same piece of wood, just turned, uh, just spun around halfway. So there's a nasty side where that big crack is and stuff. And then there's a pretty clean side where it wasn't really damaged very much. And if you saw the, the workshop thing last, last time, you, will understand what this is about. So on the right hand side, that's the live center that's holding that for support until I get it rounded out. And on the left hand side, there's a big screw in there. See that screw, a, a giant screw that's being held in the jaws of the chuck. 
and you drill a hole into the piece and drill it and, and screw it in there. Uh, the further you can screw it in, the better. And of course, you can only screw that in into a place that's going to be hollow. Because otherwise, if you screwed it in the bottom, then when you're done, you'd have a hole in the bottom where the screw used to be. So you screw it in the top and work on the bottom first. Remember the rule for lathe turning is that you almost always do the bottom first. So that's how it's held. So here I've shaped it out rough. I kind of skipped a couple of steps, I guess, but it's kind of rough shaped out. And I turned that recess in the bottom and decorated it a little bit and sanded that all off pretty smooth. So the bottom, for the bottom couple inches is done. Um, but the top, the overall shape can still be changed uh, within certain, a certain degree and it hasn't been hollowed yet. So that recess on the bottom is where I'm going to put the chuck like so. So the chuck fits into the recess. We saw this last time. And it's going to hold that. Um, and then that recess in there is only about an inch and three quarters or so. But that little recess in those jaws, when they expand inside that recess, will hold that uh, absolutely tight. So there it is on the lathe. So now you can start to hollow. Oh, and I wanted to show you something, but I forgot before. If you notice right in the dead center of this piece, there's some little like reddish brown speckles on there. That's a piece of the outside bark of the tree and those little round speckles on there, I think is some kind of fungus that was growing on the tree. Um, I should have showed you that on the original log, but so, Let's see what happens when we uh, when we go down and see what happens to those little speckles and all this these cracks and all this other stuff. So now I got it held by the chuck and nothing on the right end, so I can hollow. And here's the hollowing in process. Um, the one on the right, as you can see, it's full of shavings. And when you're hollowing, uh, especially if you're using an aggressive tool like the one on the right there uh, in the red circle, using an aggressive tool like that, it takes about 30 seconds to fill the opening with shavings. Then you have to stop and vacuum out the shavings and start again. So it takes a long time to hollow something out that's pretty big. And it always baffled me. I've seen a piece that's as big as a bowling ball and it's an eighth of an inch thick all over. And it's got a hole in the top that's a half an inch wide. It's like, it took the guy 20 hours or more to hollow that out because he had to use a little tool with a little neck on it. And every time it filled up with shavings, he had to stop it and actually vacuum the shavings out. So hollowing is, uh, is kind of weird. All right. So then it goes from there, you can sort of see that shape, but it's how thick the walls are. I got it down to where I wanted it. And again, unfortunately, this is a video, but it doesn't, it doesn't vid. So uh, that's the first piece. And since it's gonna, it's kind of tricky going in and out of the video, the slideshow, uh, I have it here next to me and I'll wait until we're done and then you can see both pieces. All right. Awesome. Back we go to the two, lo two logs. We did the one on the right. Now we're going to do the one on the left. And you can probably see that we've got different shapes going on here. The one on the right turned into a bowl that's open on the top and almost spherical. And the one on the left has a sort of a different shape. It suggests to me that I should do, make a different shape with it. So there it is mounted on the lathe. This time I'm using a spur center over on the left. I showed you one of those the other day when I was turning something between centers. And over on the right is the tailstock piece that's the live center that's holding that for support because this is a little wobbly on the lathe. It's very unbalanced because um, it's not the same diameter all the way across. So I round it off the bottom. And this time, instead of making a recess in the bottom, I'm going to make a foot. 
And if you're confused, that's understandable. Hang on a minute and you'll see how this works. So the bottom is kind of rounded off. The, remember that chuck that I told you, that I showed you a couple of times is, is will grip like a chuck on an electric drill. So it'll contract and grip and it'll also expand and grip. So the last piece I showed you, I made a recess and it expanded inside the recess. This time we're gonna grip it in the contracting mode instead. So while I've still got the tailstock up there, working on the bottom, got the bottom pretty well done. And the general shape, the overall general shape of the piece is kind of roughed in. Um, there's bark flying all over the place. And there's, you can see there's places where in the middle where the tool doesn't even touch the wood as it goes by. But the bottom is pretty much ready. And that's the important thing at this stage. So on the left, you'll see how that chuck is now gripping the foot or the tenon, we call it, where the red arrow is. It's gripping it in the contracting mode. Uh, the, the foot's about three eighths of an inch deep. That's about the depth of the jaws. You wanna get as much grip on it as you can. So now I'm holding it by the foot and that opens up the end so that I can start to hollow. So on the right, you'll see how I'm hollowing. So I'm starting to hollow up uh, the piece. You'll also see if you look closely there that the rim on this piece is gonna be very, very irregular. And a lot of people look at that and say, I don't understand how you do that um, because the tool doesn't touch the wood in some places as it goes around. And uh, explanation of that that makes sense to people is that it's because of the speed. It's when the lathe is turning fast, you hold the tool against the tool rest and you hold your tool steady and you just move it very gently and take gentle cuts. And the fact that it's sometimes cutting wood and sometimes cutting air is um, you don't even notice it after you get used to it. And, and if you're confused about what I mean, you can see where the hole is in the piece just to the right of that, there's a big uh, gap in the rim. And we'll see how that works out when we get there. So now you can see how it's, we go from just a little hole like this, the hollowing is just beginning, to now the hollowing is almost done. The outside shape is pretty well complete. The hollowing is almost complete. <clears throat> and well, what about that bottom? <laughs> oh, first, first of all, <clears throat> this is like the other piece. It has one side that's almost clear. Yeah. There's a little depression there where the bark was that I peeled off, or maybe it peeled itself off. But that side is has got eyes in it and swirls and some stuff. But it's pretty much a clear piece of wood. But look at the other side. Very distressed where the, where the wood's scabbed over to cover the damage that was done by the squirrels clear down into the sapwood. So very different on the two sides. So now it's done, took it off, I took it off the lathe. <clears throat> you take it to the bandsaw and you saw off the tenon. Uh, you could leave it on there if you wanted to decorate it, but it's got grip marks in it where the chuck, when you tighten that chuck down, it makes marks in the tenon. So usually it's not, uh, it's not worth trying to make a kind of a pedestal base on it. You'd have to do a lot of sanding or figure out some way to mount that back on the lathe to turn that down smooth. So my preference here was the design idea was to make a flat bottom. <clears throat> so you take it to the bandsaw and you saw that off. And then once you saw it off, there it is. And it's called floriform in the general idea because it's sort of shaped like a flower. Now the idea is that it's like that. And this is, again, is a video that I can't get to work. So, ta-da. It's very cool. All right, show us, show us the lives. So that's the, that's the first piece. Move this, can you see it okay? Yep. Can you see the bottom? Um, barely. Yeah, just barely. That's perfect. 
All right. So here's the first piece. Do you need more light? I can turn on another light. Nope. Is it okay? Yeah. All right. So here's the first piece. And you recognize that side. Yep. Because that's the part where the core of the tree was damaged at some point and it's split away from the rest of the wood. But here's the piece. And this side has, that's the center of the tree. And it's got rays that go out. Oak does that. It's got little rays here that emanate from that. Now we're getting to the clear part. So over here, there's not anywhere near as much going on. And then here, got another crack where the core of the young tree was damaged. And the very dark part here, the center of the tree, and back to that's back to the beginning, I think. Yeah. So this is the first piece, and oh. it's so thick. So it's probably about a, you know, a little more than a quarter of an inch thick. When I make pieces like this that are rough, I don't like to make them thin. I don't know why, I just don't. Um, and the bottom, I probably could have done a little better job on the bottom, but you see the recess that I used to hold it, little rings that I put in there just to decorate the bottom. I like to do that to surprise somebody that it's sitting there and they look at it and they go, oh, this boy, it's so smooth. And boy, look at these big cracks. And oh, what about the bottom? And they turn it over and they look and it's got a decoration in the bottom. They, whoa, I didn't expect that. So because this log was damp a little bit when I started to turn it, when I did it, this part right here was smooth when I did it. And now the dark part has sunken in there almost a 16th of an inch. So I could put it back on and make it smooth, but I don't think I will. And it's got some extra cracks and stuff in it that it didn't have before because the wood was damp when I, when I made the piece. So there you go. Okay, number one. So you got a little preview. Number two. So cool. So this, you know what? I'm not paying attention. I should have done this on the first one. So there, you can see the shape. And that's the real ugly side where all the damage was from the squirrels, cracks, wow. almost black, but stripes, it's got stripes in it. This is still the untouched part where the tool never touched this part of the wood. Then you start to get into the clear side but there are eyes in here and swirls like little burl parts, little burl up here. This side's almost clear, yeah. nice and light, light colored. And then when you get back to the back, that side again, it's that's where all the damage was done by the squirrels. That's how thick it is. Very but cool. It, but notice the rim. When you saw it on the lathe, you saw that right. the tool's not going to touch this rim all the way around. Right. You don't touch, the tool didn't touch everything until you get down to about this low. When you get so down here, some of that tool, didn't have, like, did you sand it? Like, if it has like a got like a gouge or whatever in it because of that's the wood like do you sand some of that just or do you leave it I guess it depends on what you want to do well yeah this part over here was never touched by anything mm. and usually what I do with that is just to get the any dead surface off of there whatever I scrub that with a toothbrush or something a little more okay. a little stiffer like a little brass a brass toothbrush um, to just clean it up a little bit and this got oil on it to turn it dark. I oil almost oil everything. But this piece is, has got another interesting thing going on that I didn't notice until actually until this morning. I don't know if you can see it or not. Look. Oh, wow. Well, that's the, so cool. The bark, because it was damp, <laughs> it separated. The bark is separating from the wood. Wow. And you can see it also from the back. 
See yeah. It? Wow. See it there? Yeah. So, it's really neat. And I, I, I said, oh, no, that bark is going to come off. And I went like this with my hand. It's solid as anything. Huh. The bark is um, three sixteenths thick or so, or at least an eighth. It's pretty sturdy. And oak bark is very hard. So <clears throat> it's separated right there. Yeah. But it didn't, it's not going to come off. If I saw just a little hairline crack in there, I'd squirt some glue in there and let it and glue it so it didn't come off. You know, if I sold it to somebody and two months later the bark came off, that would be like, so I, I would use glue to do that. But yeah, and this is sanded. This is finished inside all the way down. You can see it's a little shiny in the bottom. So I managed to get my uh, rotary sander down in there. So it's that's very it. very cool. It's very it's cool. Ugly piece of wood. And you can make something out of it that's, I mean, some people would look at that and go, yeah, well, you started with an ugly piece of wood and you got a couple of ugly pieces out of it. Some, you know, because these are things that not everybody likes. Right. They're dark, they're dark, they're craggy, they're, they're weird and they're uneven. And however, like you said, uh, like butter. Right, it's always so smooth. <laughs> when, yeah. you, when you sand this hardwood, it gets very smooth and silky. Yeah. And it, every place where there's a shiny surface, it's like butter. I gotta so, say, it's, it's, it's totally cool. I mean, it's totally cool. I mean, I've loved this ever since, you know, you started doing it and I, right. who would have thought? But you think we're done, don't you? Look what I have. I guess not. What is that? That's a dining egg. Oh, yeah, like the first one you made. I'm standing up here so I can hold it against my shirt. Yeah, oh, cool. This is very close in size and shape to the one that I made when I was 12 years old. But for those I, of you who don't know, darning egg, you put your sock over that, or, well, it's right. usually a sock yeah. or something like that. that I don't, well. Yeah, that I don't know where it is. So, huh. there it is. There it is. And I guess if I had planned better, I would have brought a sock. But, here, you get the idea. Here's my sleeve. So, you put, if this is a sock, you put it in there. Right. And you go like this, and then you can take your darning thread and go like this and patch yeah, up. Use it structure so that you can you can fix yeah. it. Yeah. Darning egg. So cool. So I found a piece of maple down in the basement, and I said, "Yeah, let's just make a darning egg." So. <laughs> I mean. I'll send this. I'll send this to you. Okay, fabulous. How many okay. people? I mean, how many people? Darn socks. I, mean, I shouldn't say that because been every single person Nobody. in like in a, in a Lancaster County is going to be like, I've been darning forever. Well, remember, I just saw a thing on Facebook the other day that talked about what has happened to somebody who was born in around 1900. Right. Or, right. or shortly after. Your grandmother was born in 1917. Right. So she went to school in a horse-drawn carriage not a carriage like the queen a hay wagon <laughs> right. it actually was a hay wagon with hay bales and loose hay on it and the kids rode that to school summer and winter so it's 10 below zero outside they go outside to climb up on the hay wagon put a blanket around their head and that's how they ride to school yep. she saw men walk on the moon yeah and then computers got popular and she always used to ask me, what's that dot com? What's that mean, dot com? I don't get it. <laughs> and I tried to explain it to her. It's like an address, but. Right. You know. So, darning socks? No. We get a sock with a hole in it. We throw the sock away. But our right. parents, my parents, your grandparents, they didn't do that. Right. If something was broken or something was, they put, my mother put patches on my pants. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I didn't. I had some to wear to school. It didn't have patches, 
but there were kids in my school that came to school with path, with pants that had patches on the knees because they wore out the pants. You didn't throw them away just because there was a hole in the knee, you put a patch on there. Right. And it was like artwork, you know, whatever. So, right. And right. that has, and what's that know, have to do with turning something on a lathe? Absolutely nothing. I don't know why I'm even telling you this. Well, but it's, <laughs> but it's about, you know, that there are very few people around who use a darning egg right now. But, right. But to have, but to know that, I mean, you talk about that. That's where you started <clears throat> doing woodwork was because you, you needed to, your grandma yeah. needed a, a, a darning egg. Yeah. And I don't think that darning your socks is going to make a comeback, but I think <laughs> turning stuff on a lathe has made a comeback. Absolutely. I, mean, Absolutely. I think probably in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, maybe up in up to the 60s or whatever, that just wasn't a thing. The only, you know, the only person who ever turned anything on a lathe is somebody who was making a chair or making banister yeah. rail, something like that. But with the arts and crafts movement popularity in the early part of the century, and some of that came back, and then, you know, turning came back. And now, I will tell you, you can you can Google wood turners, and there are some people out there who they're probably making a living posting their stuff on YouTube. They're making some fabulous stuff on the lathe. There's a ton of people out there, and their their lathe turnings, they're they're turned objects in the Smithsonian. So that the, the you know the the craft is getting some respect again, but with you know with the the whole the world has gone back to crafting. So people get a lot of satisfaction out of doing pottery and wood turning in whatever and macro and yeah fabric. yeah there's a lot of i mean i think that even you know covid has turned a lot of people back into those i mean people were sort of yeah. doing that in in one way or another but those kinds of things like you know gardening and quilting and cooking and baking those kinds of things have made a comeback when you're stuck at home and yep can't be near people <laughs> right so so you know you never know that darning egg could i mean it could be a long winter yeah who knows i may have to instead of going out to buy socks i may have to darn the holes in mine the ones that i have you could darn anything yeah yeah make, make it last absolutely i gotta say dad you've shown us through this series uh, I mean, truly, I mean, I think I probably say this every time. There are people out there who are like, this guy does what? And then there are people who are like, oh, he's got that tool. Uh -huh, I see. How, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think it, it, it runs that gamut from people who are like, who knew you could do this with wood to people who have been doing this themselves in their basement or their whoever for a long time. And I right. think that's fascinating. Um, I mean, my whole point of doing this was to show people, was to bring people art in a way that we couldn't do it live, any, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, who knows when you can. Yeah, this was, this was my way to bring art to, to my community and then to, bring it to your community as well. So um, it's been truly fun. Yeah, fun for me too. I hope people learn something. And I, I'm sure there's a whole lot of people who saw this that don't, that never really knew much about wood turning, but they maybe didn't even know it was a thing. So anyhow, yeah. if it opens your eyes to something new, then that's a good, a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th this was never to like have, 2,000 people run out to a lathe dealer and buy a lathe. I mean, that would be so cool and weird, but that would be very cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, this well, is... I'll, I'll do one unsolicited uh, commercial. There is a very good store called Woodcraft, and they only probably exist in fairly uh, urban areas, so there probably isn't one in Lancaster County, but uh, they have a website. I'm sure. And any tools that you saw here and a lot of other stuff, um, they, they sell not just for wood turners, but also for carvers mm. and 
um, I name it. You can go in there and buy a 10 foot long live edge walnut plank to make a bar top out of. Um, they sell all kinds of exotic lumber. They sell uh, machinery, band saws, scroll saws, sanders, drills, all kinds of tools, uh, supplies that you need for doing almost anything with wood. So Woodcraft is a good place if you're at all interested or and you don't know about them, then check that out, and that's a place you can you can buy stuff. Yeah, so. and in a lot of urban places, there's also sh the shared workspace movement. I mean, you right. pretty much cannot have a lathe in your apartment because um, right. you can't. But there are a lot of places that you can you can search if you, you're excited about this. That you can, you know. I guess it's rent by the hour or whatever, like shared workspace. And some of them come with, I would say relative, relatively, you know, experts in certain kinds of fields, at least people who know how to use all the stuff so that right. you're not going to cut your toe off or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's, this doesn't have to be out of your reach if you're interested um, because, no. you, can, you know, you can, you can do, lots of little things. I mean, I've always been fascinated with whittling. I don't know why. I just think it's, it's sort of old timey and romantic. And I just think it's sort of cool. But it, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. There's a, a co-op group like that here. I'm on, a bunch of guys who, I don't know if there are any women in it or not. The only, guy, the only people I know that are guys, but uh, I'm sure it's open to women too. Uh, they rent an old warehouse and they went together, pooled their money, and they bought a bunch of at auction sometimes you can find commercial grade tools for like nothing. Yeah. Um, so they have a planer that'll plane an 18 inch board. You know, it's like they have a bandsaw that takes four guys and two dollies to move. Wow. You know, and they, and they bought this stuff and they fixed it up and, you know, and they, I don't know if there's if they you have to pay dues or whatever for the rental, I suppose, but then they you can just drop in anytime you want and, and do stuff. And I once when my mother was <laughs> when my mother was in the nursing home, I discovered that when I was looking for a nursing home for my mother, I discovered that there are nursing homes that want to keep the men. There's an, they, Absolutely. There, aren't, there aren't very many men around at that age. They want to keep the men happy. So they have an art studio and a, work, and a workshop and, a, and they have saws and some of them have a lathe and whatever. So in a couple more years, I got to, you know, you have to help me find one of those places that I can go to the old home and uh, st still do turnings. You'll, and I'll make one of those, I'll make one of those egg things. and right, Everybody there will be like, it's a turning egg. <laughs> Look at that. All of the workers will be like, what in hell did he just make? And all of the residents will know. We well, gotta move this guy to just to, to the other ward. <laughs> He's gone over the edge. <laughs> yeah, and what's when I was in hospice, not only are there workshops like that, there's also like um there will be like places where there's like a big car engine and you can take the carburetor off and you can do right. like lots of car stuff too. So right, right. You know, for all those, all those, and mostly men, but sometimes women too, you're right. Um, and yeah, that's fascinating. So it's, well, we're just having this wonderful conversation. Did you forget that we're still tape, taping? Yes. Here? I, I mean, I, <laughs> I did it. I did not forget, but, but, okay. what's, but I think truly the point of that is that this does span generations i mean that that's yeah. that's really the point that you can be this doesn't have to be like an old guy thing this can be a young woman thing and you know you can rent a space you can have it your own you can do it at the nursing home i mean it it really is an art that you can do forever and i think that's yeah. that's why i like it i like that i mean i will forever call this an art and i know that you and we've gone around about that, that whether or not you consider yourself an artist and all that stuff, I do. So, um, and I tell my, all my friends and colleagues that my father's an artist and they're like, well, what does he do? And I'm like, well. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, but as soon as you, as soon as you have a kid, as soon as you can train them 
to be safe with sharp tools. Yeah. This is not nearly as dangerous as using like a, a circular saw or a bandsaw where right. all you got to do is slip and cut off the end of your thumb or right. whatever. So, you know, this is, uh, this is not anywhere near that dangerous because it's the wood spinning and the tool is stationary. So it's not that dangerous to your digits and whatever. But uh, as, soon as, as soon as you can train a kid to be safe with tools, then you could start them doing this. And like I said, there are lathes that are like fit on the tabletop, you know, that are like two feet long. Yeah. To make, and you can make stuff that's still, uh, you know, maybe you can't make stuff this big. Like my mini. Can, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You showed me that before. That's cool. That's yeah, I didn't, I didn't show this on camera. I was, I was organizing some stuff in my house and I have several of dad's things. And this is one of, you can, I don't have a cool little thing to put behind. Maybe I do. So yeah. this is, okay. I'm not good at spatial things. So <laughs> this is one of his little minis that he made. And has that got a hole that goes all the way through? Well, yeah, there's a hole. Yeah, on one side comes yeah, out on the other. Okay, we got to do it again. Yeah, there. There's a hole yep, that goes yep. all the way through. Yeah. Yep, from a little hollow. There's a little hollow ant trail down the middle of the tree. Yeah. So it's only, yep. you know, it's that, it's, that, it's that big. So, yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's cute. Forgot all about that. Yep. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for uh, hanging out with us over all this time and uh, enjoying this fun little series. It was certainly fun for us, so. Thanks for your patience. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. Yeah. I did. Lots Love of fun. You, Dad. See Bye. you. See you soon.